welcome to furious driving and today i'm at the wheel of a lotus sort of well ish it's a proton a proton gen 2 with handling by lotus as it turns out and this is a really nice little car that you've probably never been in chance like you might not have even seen one but it's a odd little curiosity with far more going for it than you might imagine anyway a quick word from our sponsors then on with the review Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. So yes, this is the improbably named Proton Gen 2. But why do you ask, is it called the Gen 2? Was there a Gen 1? No, is the not obvious answer. This requires a small history lesson to explain why this car is called the Gen 2 when there is no Gen 1. Proton, as a manufacturer, was started in 1983 to become the Malaysian National Car Company, an object of pride, actually, for the, for the nation. As we found out when we did the barn fine Proton that iDriver Classic is now daily driving. The number of comments we got from Malaysian viewers who are so proud to see their national product just still surviving and being taken care of in this country so far away was just quite hot warming actually anyway the first few generations of cars were not their own in-house designs so were warmed over rebadged mitsubishis which were really good cars in their day but obviously they weren't proton's own in-house designs the first actual proton design didn't appear until 2000 but even then it was an in-house design body but it was still a mitsubishi engine so it wasn't 100 percent pure proton it wasn't until 21 years later that this arrived as the gen 2 although it wasn't initially called the gen 2 and the first name didn't exactly trip off the tongue. It was called the Worm. Oh no, WRM. It was the Wera replacement model, which just trips off the tongue, doesn't it? So I guess they thought that's not going to look great on a poster. So they changed it to the Gen 2 because it was replacing the Wera, which had been very popular but was looking pretty aged by this point. And this was completely in house design by their own designers, their own engineers, with a little help from Lotus, who they kind of half owned at the time. So this is basically a Lotus sports car in, well, a, a budget friendly family hatchback. Should be quite fun then, really, shouldn't it? Now, the design was pretty exciting and modern for 2004. It was done in-house by their chief stylist, Damien Chai, and it drew inspiration, apparently, from two pieces of Malaysian culture, the handle of the Chris Dagger and the Wu Bulan Kite. And no, I can't see it either. But anyway, it does look pretty nice. It's a lovely flowing shape. It's already flush and integrated. The lights have got a curious little cutout like on a Subaru Impreza of the day. We have got quite nice sculpting on the doors giving strength and style. And it's a nice little five door hatchback shape, a bit like a Seat Leon. I'd suggest maybe there's more inspiration came from that than the Wu Bulan. Who knows? Now the front of the car with its smooth lines, fog light cutouts, big lower grille, and nicely sculpted upper radiator was very contemporary and very cool for the time. It does look a lot like a Mazda from this particular angle, doesn't it? Now here at the back of the car, we've got a lovely elegant sloping tailgate where the glass comes right up to the edge of the C-post. And this little almost integrated spoiler shaped into the boot. And these lights are so much of their time. They're so early noughties, almost factory Lexus lights in a way. And a little more inspiration from Sayat, and in fact Alfa Romeo, who Sayat stole the idea from, the way the boot cuts down into the bumper and then is reflected underneath where the number plate plinth is. This is quite nice looking. And on the boot itself, we have got three things. We've got the Gen 2 name badge, we've got the Proton factory badge, and we've got Cam Pro, which is the engine, which is a curious thing to write on there because they all came with the Cam Pro. What you don't find though, is a button to open it. Like on a Honda or a Nissan and things, you've just got a little catch down by the driver's seat and a tiny cutout for your fingers to slide in there. And then you do have an absolutely cavernous boot with lots and lots of space which even has a nice little locker on the side for putting things and 60-40 folding seats so we've got a fair degree of practicality in here and being a 2004 car we've even got an actual spare tire not a silly pump thing so as was craftily alluded to on the boot lid this car does have a cam pro engine in it and this was proton's first in-house designed engine cam pro actually stands for camshaft profiling which is all about giving it good bang for the buck plenty of power for the for the size of the engine initially it came with a 1.6 litre they're all four cylinder, double overhead cam, and the 1.6 made 110 horsepower at 6,000 RPM. 
but in 2005 they brought in a more thrifty version, the 1.3 which we see here, which makes 95 horsepower at 6,000 RPM. In terms of performance, the 1.6 with a manual transmission would do 0 to 60 in about 10 and a half seconds, bung an automatic in it, and it drops to 13 and a bit. Ooh. As the car progressed, there were various improvements to this engine during its lifetime, including in sports models later on, a variable valve timing version, so it's quite a versatile, well used engine. But what you'll notice under this bonnet is the fact that despite being a 1.3, we've got a fairly sturdy strut brace under here, which I would suggest is Lotus is doing. Now climbing inside the Proton, we've got a really cool, light, funky, sporty looking interior. From 2004, this was really cutting edge and really quite exciting. On the door, we've got some very, very cool, shiny, soft cloth, which you could imagine being this recording, which you could actually imagine adorning a very expensive sofa back in the early noughties. It has to be said though that the materials are quite plasticky. The uh, scratchy plastic of the door card itself, this very plastic feeling door pull. There's a round theme, lots of circles and things. So we've got a round door handle, but again, it's not a great feeling plastic, but it's a satin finish. And we've got a decent door speaker down in the bottom and an interesting curve all the way down here in the bottom of the door. So lots of lines and shapes, lots of really interesting design, just slightly let down by the quality of the plastic. But climbing inside, we've got more of this amazing fabric. It's like a velour edge and then this lovely soft pattern material. And you'll notice the seats are one piece molded headrest with a cut through like it's got uh, space for a racing harness. Again, Lotus. Very soft, very comfortable. You've got lots of adjustment, lots of adjustment tilts as well as back and for backs and forwards. Climbing aboard, they are quite firm actually, firmer than they look. They appear to be quite soft, but they're actually quite a firm chair. We have got a vast T-shelf area. I have no idea what the national food of Malaysia is. I should have checked this out beforehand, but whatever it is, there's room for it up there in spades, which means a lot if you're watching from Malaysia and don't know that phrase. Anyway, let's start over on the passenger side. We've got an airbag in the top of the dashboard, so passenger and driver airbag, which is good. So we, we like a bit of safety now and then. We don't frequently uh, bother with it, but today we will. We've got a nice two-tone bit of dashboard here. So the upper part is the black plastic, the lower part is this beige that matches the chairs, and that kind of theme follows into the doors as well. But again, the plastics don't feel incredible. So we've got the same theme with the doors across the rest of the interior. The design is tip top, the spend on plastics slightly lower. Underneath that, we don't actually have a glove box as such. We have a large shelf area where you can put knickknacks, tea snacks, whatever else you want to be popping in there. You can leave it in there with a little stippled rubber base so it doesn't fall off. There's an air vent over on the far left, which is quite large, and you'll notice it has the same satin paint as the door handle. So coming back into the center of the dashboard, we see an awful lot more of this satin finish, where well, it may not be paint, it may actually be just a uh, molded satin silvery finish stuff. But we've got an awesome, cool clock in the center. It sits somewhere between the lap timer you find on the dashboard of a Porsche and the set dressing for Men in Black. <laughs> it is really cool. You've got a silvery white face, you've got orange hands, a circle in an oval set into a big eye thing. It's a bit like a Ford Ka as well. Lots of interesting design. I like that a lot actually. Moving on down to a couple of enormous air vents just here, which are recessed into this lovely little sculptured line. So the dashboard comes down, steps in, steps out. It's all over the place. It's great. And then we've got a bank of controls, which um, four of the <laughs> Four of the seven don't actually do anything, but three of them do. Got hazard warning lights, rear screen heater, rear fog lights, and then just symmetry for the rest of it. But this is something to get very excited about underneath. This is the original radio with CD player in it. I have never seen a Blaupunkt for Proton cars radio like this before. Let's just flick this on quickly. I had to turn the engine on so it doesn't beep at me, but look at this. We've got our display is here in this round center section, and the buttons are arranged very Seriously, with numbers on the left, a few on the right, volume and C key, the side of that screen, the mode up there. It's a very, very sci-fi set dressing kind of a thing, which is also echoed underneath where we've got, instead of a regular center console dashboard, we've got a thin column going from top to bottom. Again, in this silvery, satin colored, goldy stuff. And that has got a trio of knobs for our ventilation, which even has air conditioning and a little slightly silverier ring outlining the edge of it. Following back into 
a weird round blanking thing, more beige plastic, another circle encapsulating the gear shift, and of course it is a manual gear shift, this isn't the original shifter, five speed manual, awesome, and then we've got space for electric windows, two, not even blanks, <laughs> this is actually one of the funniest blanks I've ever seen. Um, we've got passenger side window just there, got a driver side window with one touch down there, and I guess if it had rear electric windows, these would move up to the front, and these would be the rear windows, but there's not. There's literally nothing here. That's just, just cruel, frankly. We've got a blanking plate for who knows what. We've got the 12 volt socket just there, and we've got the shonkiest cup holder I've seen all year award. So that's, that's pretty awful, actually. <laughs> And behind that we have got a decent sized cubby hole which doubles as an armrest. And I'm not letting this go without special mention because holy moly, look at this handbrake. This is just incredible. It's like a, I don't know, some kind of gun grip or something. Very exciting. Right, moving on up from that epic piece of industrial design, we have got another really cool bit of stuff going on here. I'm gonna suggest a little bit more cribbing from Alfa Romeo because these heavily cowled instruments are straight out of a 147 or 156 because, well, they just are. I mean, really, honestly, if you saw that little top bit in isolation, you would assume you were looking at a picture of a 156 or 147. Anyway, these are cool little dials. They, Lexus-like, have got sub-dials for the fuel and the temperature inside the uh, the main dials. Rev counter on the left, red lining at 6,500 RPM, and speedometer going up to 120 miles an hour. Looking very cool indeed with that silvery white background, bright orange needles. This is very, very early noughties sports car feel. Think of pretty much any early noughties sports car and you'll be getting the vibe I'm thinking of. MG, TF, Mini, Cooper, Supercharged, uh, Saxo, VTS, this kind of thing. This is very much in this vibe, especially with the silvery plastic all around the edge. To the left, we've got another little blanking plate and we've got headlamp levelling, and to the right we've got another little blanking plate. They do love a blanking plate, don't they? We have got some fairly sturdy stalks either side of the steering wheel for indicators and lights on the left, wipers on the right, and then we've got a pretty funky steering wheel. Again, it's quite plasticky, but it does look really cool. We've got the fake Allen key heads in the centre around the horn, we've got the airbag, we've got radio controls. I think because it's not the loveliest of feeling things, the owner has put a, uh, a leather wrap around it just to give it a bit more tactile, nice feeling. And then down on the right hand side, we have a continuation of our left hand side passenger shelf. And down here below, and down here by our right knee, we have got a continuation of the passenger side shelf. And last but not least for the front of the car, we have got ignition on, horn test. Ooh, that's a first generation original design part. And to complement the first generation original design part, we have got manual mirrors. Never, never let it be forgotten. And we have also got the most annoying beep in the world to remind us we have still got keys and ignition. Let's look in the back of the car. Climbing into the back, we've got virtually the same kind of deal. We've got the shiny black plastic. We've got the satin, silvery gold plastic, slightly plasticky door handle, lovely fabric just there, which is a weird uh, juxtaposition of niceness and then multiple tones giving stuff. We have got cranky upkeep for windows here and uh, the owner's dad has fitted some Maybach style curtains in the back to give us a whole luxury feel. Stepping in the back, we have got all oh, these nice looking one piece seats, which you can look through We've got pockets on the back of them. We've got this interesting three-part mat set, so your carpets can always stay clean. Very, very comfy seats. Nice contrast tone seat belts. It is very nice indeed, but the rear floor feels very high indeed, and the seat feels quite low to give you enough headroom. So, so for a grown-up, it's actually a little bit hard to sit comfortably, even though I have got fairly reasonable headroom, and it's quite nice and light and airy in here, thanks to the. Uh, little quarter light windows in the back of the door, adding a nice bit of extra light into here. Right, let us get the Proton Gen 2 out on the road. Now, despite being merely a 1.3 with 95 horsepower, it feels really peppy. It's fairly small engine, gives way more performance than you would expect it to be able to. It's, this road is unfortunately a little bit straight for me to be demonstrating how good the handling is, but trust me, it goes around the corner well. We'll find some bends in a moment and demonstrate. Here we go. Nice 60 mile an hour open road. 
forward it in fourth gear, although I think it'll be fine in fifth. And the car just sails through, feels really composed, a little bit of lean, no hint of understeer, oversteer, no scrubbing or anything like that. It's just lovely, just flows through the bend, feeling very, very composed and relaxed. It is a great car to drive, it has to be said. The steering is really, really nicely weighted. So you go into a corner and there's just exactly the right amount of feedback and resistance on the wheel. It's like they've really thought about this really hard. The ride, again, considering it's a budget-friendly family hatchback, as I described earlier, is really comfortable too. So far on these roads, it's not been jittery or harsh. It's been very good indeed. And the brakes, let's give them a quick tap. Yeah, they're good. Discs at the front, drums at the rear, you know the drill. was a global car and it was sold literally everywhere around the world with very few exceptions. But what makes this slightly unusual in that respect is that unlike many global cars where there were factories set up for local markets, this particular one was only built in Malaysia. So it's a little unusual in that respect. Although it's a little unusual in terms of a family hatchback, it does put it in line with things like the Lotus or Rolls Royce. Yeah, not often you get a uh, Proton Gen 2 compared to a Rolls. But today, we're doing that for you. Now we've inadvertently ventured onto a dual carriageway and sitting at 70 miles an hour. Admittedly, it's a bit loud on this terrible concrete road, but the car is, again, really nicely stable, composed. It's a car you feel like you could do a long way in quite happily if you really wanted to. I actually found this car at the Festival of the Unexceptional a couple of weeks ago. And at the time, the owner was thinking of selling it and had a for sale sign in the back window. However, since then, he's actually decided he likes it enough, he's not going to sell it. <laughs> he thinks it's too nice to get rid of, so he's keeping it. And as far as photo standard oddities go, it really is ideal. Looking back at contemporary reviews of these things from the early noughties through to 2012 when they were deleted for domestic sales but continued on for foreign export, a common theme does kind of appear and that was that reviewers, including James May on Top Gear, were very impressed with how the car looked, they loved the look of the interior, they were quite impressed with the handling, but as a solid theme they all felt the interior let the car down, It was, which I'm kind of inclined to agree with because the plastics just do feel very very plasticky indeed which is a shame because it is a lovely car but it is part of its individual character because the styling is undeniably very interesting and I like it a lot and the thing really does drive nicely the gearbox is just fantastic to flick through and the steering's perfectly weighted the seating position is a little unusual. I've found that it's either a little bit too high or tipping a little too far forward. So I've not 100% found my perfect position just yet. But that aside, the car is very nice to be in. So if you were looking for an unusual car that you're not going to see any other ones of in the car park that didn't exactly break the bank, this is exactly the car for you today. Back at the time, it was criticised, apart from the interior, for being a little bit more expensive than the equivalent Kias and Hyundais, which were its closest competitors at when it was new. Well, thank you for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this really unusual and interesting little slice of Malaysian family carriage. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join us next time for something completely different.